You are at Nelson's and you are very welcome to be here, as is my fabulous friend, Victoria Arbiter, who is so gorgeous. Oh, you Look make me feel you. so good, Look Nelson. at you. You'd never know she was a mother. <laughs> it's because I'm sucking it in with my Spanx on. You don't have Spanx on. Always. You're absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. I don't know what your, I, well, I was going to say I don't know what your gene pool is, but Victoria, if she looks familiar to you, is probably America's best uh, face for royal reporting. Is that fair to say you're the royal correspondent? Royal correspondent, yes. I'm the only one that's based in America anyway, so it means that I get to go into the studio as and when breaking news happens, which is so funny. The royals have set events during the year. We've got Trooping the Colour, and there's the Cenotaph Remembrance Sunday, and there's all these things, these organised events that the royals roll out to. But then, of course, you get Harry doing naked billiards in Vegas, or Pippa, who's not royal, but who royal watchers are really keen on following, cavorting around Paris with very rich Frenchmen with plastic guns in the back of the car. So there's always something to talk about. Well, I, I report a lot for Australia, so people say, but you're not Australian. Um, yeah. You have the pedigree of, of the British Isles. In fact, your father is... Um, is a colleague of ours yes, as well, Dickie Arbiter. Now, I, before you explain what his background is, did they name you Victoria just so you could be Vicky to his Dickie? No, I mean, it literally, it makes my father's ears bleed if anyone calls me Vicky. And my grandmother, I remember the very first time she met my husband, he referred to me as V. And she looked at him with these scathing, piercing blue eyes and said, why would you call her V when she has a beautiful name like Victoria? And I was mortified, because my grandmother is very particular. She's a classy lady. But growing up, everyone called me Vix and Vicky because that's what happens at mm. school, but I never liked Vicky. And then when I got into this line of work, Vicky and Dicky was so painful. It was just <laughs> too awful. I was like, we've really got to put... You don't have a brother, this. Nicholas, hiding no, in No, I know, yeah, Vicky, Dicky, Nicky. I do have, no, I don't. I've got a half-sister who's not his who happens to be a Nicola. But uh, it's no, crazy. I know. <laughs> There's a reality. If, if Ryan here. Seacrest is watching, you're going to be the new E reality <laughs> series. Oh, gosh. Well, my father is somewhat of a liability because I think he's earned the right at his age and his experience and everything he's gone through to be able to speak his mind and say it exactly as it is. So sometimes mm. I'll sugarcoat some of the slightly more odd questions we might get, whereas he'll just cut someone down. But does he respect that in reverse? Does he, does he like candor like that? He does. Well, I think he understands that in order to be appealing to younger people, which is the beauty of William and Kate, they have brought the monarchy into the present day in terms of relevance and people's interest in them. And so he knows that there's got to be a different feel and a different vibe. And also it's very different for an American audience because to be fair to the American audience, they're not necessarily interested, not everybody anyway, in the years back history. So you can get a little... We, we always tease him, he's like Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast. His knowledge is so extensive. But I would say that at the moment, certainly, the majority of Americans are William, Kate and Harry centric. And so he understands that and plays into it and he has a sense of humor with it. Um, Unless you're a toast sucker and then you like Fergie. Yes. Now oh explain gosh. to the audience what your father's pedigree is as a royal expert. Sure, well, when I was growing up, he was actually the court correspondent for LBC News Radio, which was fantastic for me because I grew up with him by myself my parents were divorced and at a number of the royal events he couldn't get a babysitter and I loved nothing better than to be sitting on the roof of the news van we'd have the best seat in the house literally for for everything so he sitting was... on the roof of the news van. <laughs> yeah and it was great and of course in those days everyone I don't want to age myself dramatically but there wasn't sort of the anxiety of a child being out of your sight for a nanosecond mm. oh my god they've been kidnapped so I would be spending all day on the roof of the news van with the satellites next to me and um, he was doing that for a number of years and that's where I had my very first radio experience he used to do the Christmas morning breakfast show and we weren't allowed to open our presents until after he'd done that show and so that was my when I was five years old it was my very first time to be on the radio opening a present with him did he not work directly with Her Majesty at he one did. point? He did. So what happened, he was working for LBC and someone approached him and said, there's somebody who's interested in you for a job, you're going to get a phone call. And it all sounded very mysterious. It was like, well, what could this be? And then an offer was extended asking him to join the press office for the Prince and Princess of Wales, of course, Charles and Diana. And it was a tremendous honor because so. the palace and the media, it's not a fruitful relationship. Mm. There's a lot of conflict often. And so the fact that they were inviting him to join the office spoke of their respect for him and their appreciation of him. Of course, he was delighted. 
So he started out working for Charles and Diana, and uh, he thoroughly enjoyed both of them, but Diana sort of was more a great sense of humor, oh, of course, you know. Yeah. What every, a surprise. Yeah, and every man in the Charles world. Charles and Diana, but I somehow prefer Diana. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So when they separated, they were asked, who do you want to work for? And of course, it was a very difficult situation because you were supposed to show loyalty to the future king mm. and Charles, and yet there was this loyalty to Diana, this affection for Diana. And around that time, there was the fire at Windsor Castle, which was devastating, but suddenly this new position opened up. They needed someone to handle the opening of Buckingham Palace and all the media and the press. And someone came to him and said, would you like it? And he went, yes, yes, please, save me from this decision. And that's when he moved into the Queen's press office. The things that you saw growing up, you must have had encounters with the royal family. Tell me about some of those, because really, I mean, that's what yeah, everybody that's wants to stuff. know. That's the fun stuff. Well, actually, and I hope this is okay to say, but um, it was actually Prince Harry and Diana that broke it to me that my teen crush, George Michael, happened to bat for the other team. Oh. Was this before or after the men's room incident? Well, do you know, I was probably young and naive enough to not really know or be paying attention. I think it was before. So what happened, Diana was having a <laughs> Christmas party and it was for family, friends, and a few people that she enjoyed working with. And we were living at Kensington Palace at the time. And so she said, well, you should come on up. And as we were walking in, Elton John was just ahead of us. And I was dying, oh my gosh, it's Elton John, it's Elton John, and we're here at Kensington Palace. And so we went inside and I saw Elton John leave quite soon after, and I hadn't had a chance to talk to him. So I'm standing with my father and my How sister. old are you at this point? I am 17. Okay. So I'm standing with my dad and my stepmother and Prince William and Harry were around. It was, going, it was the night that William gave his very first public address. He was going to thank all the guests for being there. And Diana came over and George Michael was just kind of over there. And uh, she said, what's going on over here? And I said, I'm really trying to pluck up courage to talk to George Michael. And she started giggling and she said, he is dishy, isn't he? I, was like, I really like him. <laughs> and Harry was standing next to her and of course he was quite young. And she said, but isn't it a shame that he doesn't like ladies? And of course, children, they hear mm. everything. And so Harry's tugging on her skirt. Who, mummy? Who doesn't like the ladies? Who? And she's going, Harry, shut up, shut up. Because of course, everyone's now sort of, well, who doesn't like the ladies? <laughs> so Diana said, I dare you, go over there and introduce yourself. And I said, I can't, I can't. So she goes, Harry, go and introduce your friend Victoria to George Michael. Harry goes, who's my friend Victoria? <laughs> and it's like, she's right here, she's right here. I said, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I walked over to him. And over George Michael's shoulder, I could see Diana in fits of giggles, which is who she was. Yeah. She just was laughing all the time. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll take the dare. And so I introduced myself. Unfortunately, two days later, there had been a 60 minute style documentary profile on George Michael. So I was suddenly very well versed mm. in impressive things about his career, not just that he was dishy. So we were able to have quite an articulate informed conversation which lasted five minutes and then I just started drooling and panicked and ran away but it was just one of those lovely experiences that was very personal and intimate and it wasn't Diana on show because she was in her environment and it was a private party and Diana's you know she's in many ways she feels like she's still with us I want to find out where you were when you got the news mm -hmm. that she wasn't still with us mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about the upcoming royal birth um, which if yes. you're watching this after the birth we can't spoil it for you, you can spoil it for us. Yeah. Um, so where were you the night Diana died? Oh, it was awful. I was living in New York, I was at drama school here, it's why I'd moved here. And uh, someone called me and said, something's happened to Diana. And I said, well don't be ridiculous, because my dad would have called, it was 10 o'clock at night here. So uh, that's what, two, three o'clock in the morning in England. And I turned on the TV and, and I didn't see anything yet, but I, I started getting very anxious. And I called him and he answered immediately, which, you know, at three o'clock in the morning is unusual mm. for someone that should be fast asleep. And I said, what's happened? And uh, he had just had the phone call that she was dead. Oh, God, I mean, I've got goosebumps even telling you now. Um, and I, I just, my gosh, was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I think I sat for two, three days just bawling in mm. front of my television. I couldn't leave it. And I thought, this is crazy. I've just got to go home. I need to be at home. So I flew home um, and, uh, gosh, I don't want to say lucky, but felt honoured enough to have been invited to her funeral. 
And that day we were walking to the funeral and it was bizarre because the streets of London were, you saw the images, packed with people everywhere. There were people, but there was not a sound. And I couldn't believe, we had to walk to Westminster Abbey from Kensington Palace because no cars were allowed in the center of London. And you're just walking and just, there was that sense of anticipation, but dread and this collective grief. And then every now and then there'd be a wail. And British people don't mm. wail. They're so reserved. Stiff upper lip yes. and all that. Heaven forbid you show emotion. So we had to get to Westminster Abbey quite early and we were in our seats. And when Diana's coffin left Kensington Palace, every minute of the procession, the bells tolled one toll. And you're sitting in there and you just hear this boom. And then 59 seconds later, boom, and oh, it was the most agonizing wait. Um, but at the time, I suppose, because we were inside, we didn't have any television, there were no screens inside or anything. I didn't see the images until much later that day of William and Harry walking behind that procession, and it just... So you weren't working as a journalist at this point? No, no, I was still in drama school. And my dad, it was interesting because in the summer, August anyway, the royals are on holiday. They all are. That is the month they have off. And so most of Diana's office were away on holiday. There was no reason for them to be in town. And so my dad, who was around, got roped into organizing everything. And in a way, I think it saved him that week because his grief was immense, but he couldn't focus on it. He just... There's a job to be done. I'm going to do her proud. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And so he sort of worked like a Trojan warrior that week and crashed the next week. But as I referred to earlier, silly questions. Questions were coming in like, there's a card on the front of the coffin that says, Mummy, now who's that from? And it's just <laughs> all you can do to go, really? Really? So, uh, no, it was... Um, it was just the emotions were sort of like this, you know, the wonder, those flowers. I've never seen a carpet of flowers like that. You saw a picture of it and thought, well, that's a lot of flowers. But then you actually saw it and they went for miles and miles and miles. Well, it seems like Diana would be most pleased yeah. with her children and how uh, they've turned out and what they're doing with their lives and how they're handling the press and, and just sort of all around everything. She probably wishes the hair gene were a little better <laughs> for her eldest son. But, or she uh, would have started a mom for P show yeah. or something, yeah. But uh, bless him, at least we know who his father is. Yes. Um, what do you make of, now that we're seeing the next generation come in, how has the press handled Kate's pregnancy, in your opinion? I think there's been a dramatic improvement in terms of the stalking, I suppose. Like, Diana couldn't drive out of Kensington Palace without their press being press at the gates. And that was actually what was quite fun for my friends and I, because we had to drive out those same gates when we lived at Kensington Palace. And we just drive really fast and pretend that we were Diana to see if someone would take our picture. <laughs> you know, but for her, of course, it was miserable. Um, William made it very, very clear that paparazzi-style journalism would not be tolerated. That was the reason he filed a case when those topless pictures came out. He couldn't stop those pictures, but it was about setting a precedent for the future. It's not going to last. It can't possibly last. But I think journalists and photographers certainly, no one will ever forget seeing those paparazzi photographers in that tunnel in Paris being put into the back of a police van and that sense of responsibility they carry. As I understand only one of all of those photographers is still a photographer. They all quit that night. Um, so I think it's been remarkable to this point, but I do worry for when the baby comes because William has a very difficult time with private versus public. He wouldn't reveal the name of his dog when he got the dog for a good two to three weeks. It was like, William, pick your battles. You know, we respect that you want to keep an element of your private life, of course, but it's a dog. And so with the child, He's going to be so keen for that child to have as normal a life as possible because a firstborn, of course, will one day carry the mantle of kingship or queenship, whatever it may be. Um, but he's going to he's going to have a, a hard time with that because baby pictures are going to sell mm -hmm. and people want to know. And there is a public interest because it is a future heir to the throne. Um, I think he's going to find it difficult. All right, not to put you on the spot, but I'm yeah. putting you on the spot. Go for it. And just, you know, it'll be fun. We'll look back on this and say, oh, I was so right or so yeah, wrong. Yeah. Do you think it'll be a boy or a girl? I think I want it to be a girl because historically, British women have done so well in the top job. You look at Queen Victoria, Elizabeth I, our current queen, and we would have just had Charles. I thought you were going to say Margaret Thatcher there. No, 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 and we would have just had Charles, we would have just had William, time for a girl. But 
I have never been right on predicting the gender of a baby, so I'm guessing it's a boy. What about, did you think you were having a daughter when you had your son? Oh, I was convinced. <laughs> what would I do with a boy? So I was sure I was having a girl, and then a boy came and I was like, oh my goodness, really? Are you sure? Are you sure? So, and all my friends, I haven't been right on a one of them. I'm, and, so. okay, so if you're predicting a girl, and what do you I'm suppose they'd girl. name? So names, well, first of all, for everyone watching, save your money on betting on Diana. The bookies are running such a tight business that everyone's betting that a baby girl is going to be called Diana. It is not going to happen. William and Harry honor their mother in private, personal ways, and why give your child that cross to bear and have to live with that? Will it be a nice name like Anne? Elizabeth, Mary, or is it going to be like Apple, no, Trixie, no. some sort of Hollywood kind of name? It's going to be very traditional. They are naming the future heir to the throne. So my guess, if I were a betting person, I'm going with Alexandra for a first name. That is the current queen's middle name. There's not going to be a first name of the I living I did not royal. know that. There Alexandra? Alexandra. Second name, Elizabeth, for the current queen, out of respect to her. Third name, I'm going with Francis, which was Diana's middle name. It is a way to pay tribute to Diana without making it really blatantly obvious. If it's a boy, I'm going with George for a first name. That's the Queen's father. Philip will be a middle name for, obviously, Philip, Prince Philip. And then we'll probably see Arthur or Louis, which Charles and William uh, share as middle names. And then I think Charles will feature as well. So mm. they're big on lots of names, but it'll be very traditional. Well, and you mentioned Charles. I mean, seriously, <laughs> is he ever going to ascend to the throne? Will yes. he get his five minutes? Yes, he will. And bless his heart, you know, you raise a very valid point. He is the longest serving heir apparent in history. But the heir not so apparent. No, he will. He will ascend the throne. What people will have to understand is that he will not have the opportunity to create a legacy like his mother but he, has, he will be coming to the throne with so much experience, so much knowledge and education from his mother. So he's going to be a very valuable uh, king. He really is. As an English woman, yes. make the case for why Britain needs its monarchy. Because so many, there are so many arguments against it. Yes. Luckily, we have new hot young yeah. cast members in this soap opera to, to focus on. But but make the case for a monarchy. For me, I'm I am a monarchist, and so I like the element of history. We're talking hundreds of years. But if you're going to talk on a business sense, people come to the United Kingdom because of the royal family. The Diamond Jubilee celebrations last year were epic. If I hadn't seen it for myself, I wouldn't have believed that actually it was bigger than the royal wedding. People come to visit Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, the crown jewels that in turn pours thousands, hundreds upon thousands of pounds into the British economy. England doesn't make anything anymore. All the mm -hmm. business, much like America, has gone overseas. So how can we still have a British product? And one thing you cannot say made in China is the British royal family. So I think if we were to lose them, aside from the fact we lose the identity of our country, but I like the fact that we also have a non-elected official, and this makes me very unpopular with the Republicans, but. Elected officials generally, and this is a large generalization, they cause corruption, scandal. It becomes so divisive. Whereas the Brits, we don't come together terribly often. It's normally if we're winning in the Soccer World Cup or something, but give us a big event with pageantry, the royal wedding, the trooping of the color every year, the Diamond Jubilee, and they come out in their millions. It's an excellent point. Because what yeah. have we got? We got the Hiltons and the Kardashians. You know, but, that's our royalty. And you don't have anything that unifies the country all at one time. I mean, best case really is the inauguration, but you still got all the people that didn't vote Absolutely. for that president. And I, I really like the fact that Diamond Jubilee is a brilliant example. We had four days of celebrations, and on day one, rain was going sideways. It was freezing, and the people came and I was like, well, they're not coming tomorrow, so what are we gonna do on day two and three and four? Day two, there were more of them. Day three, there were even more. Day four, Prince Philip was in the hospital. It was the most solemn of the occasion, of all the occasions, and they were there in their thousands. And I was like, this is pretty great. You know, it's so funny because she, oh, look, that's, I, every time I see you, I'm, <laughs> I'm mesmerized by the ring. Her husband does all right. Um, <laughs> We do talk about other things, but it's so difficult, yeah. even when we go out for dinner, the two of us, to, to not 
have some sort of royal conversation. Yeah. People want to ask me about Hollywood, and people want to ask you about London, and uh, it's unavoidable. That's, Isn't it good we like our topics then? That's good, yeah. but you know, it's, that's for, for sure. Um, one of the reasons I made sure I would get this is so that we'd get to some non-royal <laughs> things as well. <laughs> You're going to pick okay. out 10 different <gasps> questions, and then you'll give me your short off the top of your head answer. So just pick out 10 and set them down, and then I'll... So this is like first thing that comes into my first head. First thing. Don't, really don't overthink these. Okay. All right. Who's a deceased star you wish you could have met? Oh, my goodness. Audrey Hepburn. Well, Audrey Hepburn. Go look in the Water mirror. You won't to. feel so I'll bad. Stop. You'll just look there. I'll there she stop. is. If you could have a personal trainer, chef, or driver, which would it be? Chef, for sure. My smoke alarm goes off five out of seven nights a week. You're English. <laughs> no, <laughs> chef. <laughs> Ryan Gosling, awesome or overrated? Oh my, my boyfriend. My boyfriend. Have you seen Blue Valentine? Mm. Of course you've seen Blue Valentine. Yes, I love him. He's my number one Hollywood crush. Have you seen your husband? He's a little yeah, Ryan Gosling. Yeah, but I Gosling live with is. him, and he leaves cupboard doors open, and I trip over the dishwasher because he doesn't shut it. Ryan Gosling, of course, in my fancy land, doesn't do that. Her husband's name is Ryan. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Best subject in school? History. English Funnily history? enough, uh, history in general. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Do you it. read William Rutherford? No. Oh, he wrote Sam. I'll, I'll turn okay, you we'll on talk, to him. Okay, we'll talk, we'll talk. Right. Beyonce, awesome or overrated? Amazing, but I don't have any of her albums. I've just totally everyone just turned off. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're going, mm-hmm. All right. Last time you had a hangover. This morning. <laughs> Makeup. Yeah, no. No, I, uh, uh, the last time I had a proper hangover, this is what's quite fun about um, when you get a little bit older, you can't do it quite like you did in your 20s. But um, last summer, my best girlfriend came to Greece with me and we pulled an all-nighter and we haven't done that in a really long time. And when we got home, we didn't want to wake our husbands up. And so we both went to sleep in the clothes that we had come home in and then staggered out in them at 10 o'clock. And it was rough. The walk of shame. Strawberry daiquiri walk oh. of shame. Nice. Fabulous. Name one of your guilty pleasures. Il Devo. Oh, oh I love them. I, I, I mean, I love them. And um, they are absolutely my guilty pleasure. And my poor husband has had to come to so many concerts. But if I'm at home, my cat loves them too. And so if I'm at home by myself, I will just have my Il Devo on and my cat will sit next to my computer and we'll just be in heaven. They're good, they're good. Biggest celebrity crush? Hugh Jackman. Oh. Didn't even have to think about that one, no, did I? No, all right. Yeah. Oh, but he did just replace George Clooney. Oh, he's your biggest celebrity? Yes. Okay. Well, George Clooney is so, I don't know. 2001. Yeah, exactly. All right. What did you have for breakfast today? Peanut butter toast every day. <laughs> every day. And finally, who's a historical figure you wish you could have met? Elizabeth I. I know. It's so it's so obvious, isn't it? Very dull to pick a royal, but. But Judy Dench, Elizabeth I. What did Judy Dench know? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, did, no, she, she did. did. Yes, she, she did. did. I thought so. Or Kate Blanchett, Judy, uh, Elizabeth. Oh, either, either version. But then, if we start getting into all of that, you know, Henry VIII, he's portrayed as this villain. I would have loved to have met him, but I would have wanted to be on his good side. Um, yeah, I'm afraid all of my historical figures that I'd want to meet are Brits, because Winston Churchill, what a fascinating man to have had a cup of tea with and just quizzed post-war and. Yeah, Elizabeth I will put her first. See, you can have brains and beauty if you're a Victoria <laughs> Arbiter. I struggled on a couple of those, <laughs> but we almost got there. I, a lot of people ask me this, and I'm sure you must get the same question. So what is your answer to how do I get to do what you do? How do, how do I study to be a royal reporter? You know, it, it looks so glamorous. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks fun. Not, of course, yes, which it is. How, so. You know, we've, we've heard the story of how it came about, yeah. but what, what's your advice to folks who want to pursue a career chasing the royal story? I think you would, and I don't know if you would say the same, but I think you will identify with what my answer would be. It doesn't matter what line of, of expertise you have in this area on television. You've got to know your stuff. You just have to. I see so many people fudging it, not getting the facts right, and I think it's irresponsible. And if you don't know the answer, there's a way to talk around it, or there's a way to say, do you know what, that's a really interesting point, and I'm, I would like to know more about that. Let's get back to that, or something. But don't try and fudge anything. I, I get very irritated when I, I see people sort of just, 
trying to, I guess, take the fast route. And it's unfortunate we've got shows like American Idol now that make a superstar overnight, you know, and it's, you're not going to ever be a superstar as a royal contributor. But I think people have this idea that everything's sort of easy, but it isn't. It takes a lot of work behind the scenes. Like every single time I go in to do a story, I don't just show up and wing it and hope that I'm going to know the answers. I will have done so much research on all the different areas that an interviewer might take it. So they'll say to me, you're coming in to talk about the new Commonwealth Charter that the Queen has signed. So first, what is a Commonwealth yeah. Charter? And then what has it been historically? And which countries are going to not like this? And it's not that you'll necessarily answer all those questions, but it gives you so much on which to draw. So I think whether you're an antique specialist, whether you're the Hollywood specialist, the royal specialist, you've got to know what you're talking about. Preparation. Preparation, every time. Preparation and punctuality. Well, I'm going to prepare uh, a shepherd's pie oh, in yum, your honor yum. and punctuality I will come over and we'll watch Downton Abbey and oh, eat shepherd's pie together that sounds magic send your husband out with the kid for the night and we'll, <laughs> we'll just do that and drink Can strawberry we, um, daiquiris we'll do, and maybe listen to Olivo while it's heating up during the com oh there's no commercials on no no no, no but we'll while do. we're yeah. heating the food and then when we sit down to watch Downton Abbey we'll do you know what I have in my fridge what Branston pickle Oh my gosh. Do you, do you keep any Are Branston pickles? Are you pseudo British? I love Branston How pickle. How do you have Branston yeah. pickle? You can buy it at Zabar's and oh. uh, it's great on a baked potato. Interesting. Good to know. I love having you over. Thank you. So fun. Thank you so my much. Girl. Victoria Arbiter, where do you do? It's the website, victoriaarbiter.com. Yes. Then you can go at Victoria. Thank you. Mwah.